this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore this Osborne OCC1 vintage computer. In the previous video in this series we used the Fluke and found a faulty, or what we suspected was a faulty uh, RAM chip. Uh, we were getting a stuck bit, it was um, giving us a value of 4 uh, rather than 0, so bit 2 seemed to be sticking. So I've replaced that uh, IC, so that's a, a new uh, RAM chip, and uh, we'll now look at the Fluke and see if we can actually successfully write some data into that bank and uh, if we resolve the problem. If you recall from the previous video, when we tried to write into that uh, memory bank, uh, in this case it was a uh, an address of 2000 hex. We couldn't successfully write all the bits we were getting bit 2 sticking. So we'll try it again. So write address 2000 which is right in the middle of the bank occupied by that IC. We'll write a value of FF. We'll read that back. Looks alright so far. We'll now try writing a value of 0 to the same address. And we'll try and read that back and it now appears to be working so looks like that was indeed the faulty device I'm going to run it through a short and long RAM test for the entire memory bank and um, we'll see if uh, it succeeds if it does then I'll plug everything back together and we'll try booting it from the floppy disk again well it looks like we might have a bit of an unusual fault and um, I still think it's a RAM chip but normally when the RAM chips fail they uh, the output um, fails the output driver fails on them so it's basically the uh, none of the addresses within the chip will work and as you can see we can uh, successfully read and write to address 2000 and um, the RAM chips are one bit by 16k so the the block from 0 to 4000 hex is uh, all on uh, one set of eight ICs so anything we write any address that we write to in that range it's actually using the same devices and one bit per device so as you can see at 2000 uh, we're fine if we try and write at 1000 so we'll try and write a value of 0 read that back you can see it's fine. However, if I try and write at a different address, so we'll try uh, 100, and we'll write a value of 0, read that back, and this time bit 7 is sticking, so it's not uh, responding the way it should. If we go to a different address, so we'll try address 1, and again we'll write a 0, read that back and that's okay we'll try address 2 read that back and that's sticking so there's something strange going on it's it's most likely a faulty uh, RAM chip the memory decoding on this is a bit strange so it still could be part of the glue logic around the uh, memory mapping but the most likely is that some of the cells within that um, set bit 7 RAM uh, IC are faulty. So that's the easiest thing to check. So I'm going to start by replacing that IC. And um, if that doesn't cure the problem, we'll have to start delving into the, um, the, the memory mapping. And as I said, it's a bit strange. And bear in mind, it uses DRAM, so it also has some... Uh, of timing for uh, refresh uh, as well as the read and write cycles so um, as I say most likely this is uh, an issue with the RAM chip but um, needless to say we need this test to uh, succeed if we're going to get this machine to work and just to uh, back this up we'll do an actual RAM a short RAM test uh, over a uh, limited range so we'll go from one up to 100 and you can see at address 2 uh, which is the address that we manually found an issue with we're getting a failure it seems unlikely it's addressing um, because 
um, even if it was selecting the wrong address within the device, it's, it would be doing the same thing every time. So even when we came, if it was writing to the wrong cell, for example, uh, as long as it was writing the right value, when we try and read it, if it's still reading from that same incorrect cell, uh, it would still read back the correct value. It's just that uh, it wouldn't work because obviously it wouldn't be able to select different cells. So most likely it's the device itself. We'll try doing a, uh, a RAM test over a different range. We'll go from 50 up to 200. And this time it's failed at 100. So again, kind of strange, um, but I'll get the uh, bit seven uh, RAM chip replaced and we'll see if we can get any further through the test. So I've replaced the bit 7 RAM chip and we'll try the test again. So we'll do a short RAM test from 1 up to 100. If you recall it was failing at address 2 before. Okay so now it's passing. So what I'll do now is plug the system back together. I'll, I'll run through the full um, memory uh, range and make sure that we don't have any further failures. If we do I'll get back on camera um, but if it's uh, all the tests pass then I'll plug all the uh, boards back together and we'll try and boot it up and see what happens. I've got the units plugged back together and uh, I would say that I was doing the uh, final test that I was showing you just now with the daughter boards plugged in and uh, that was just to make sure that they weren't interfering. And luckily, I only had to unplug the um, the disk drive board to get to the uh, the RAM chip I needed to change. I could leave the uh, display pack board in place because that's a bit of a pain to get in and out. And I suspect uh, there's a very limited number of times you can do that before the sockets start to fail. Um, so I replaced um, bit seven as we saw, and I powered this up. Now I was going to power this up and just hit the toggle switch and hopefully uh, see it boot up. I'm not quite sure if it will yet. Um, but when I first powered this up after reassembling everything, um, it wouldn't run. That The display wasn't showing anything. Both drives were making very uh, weird noises. So I quickly switched it off. And it turns out that uh, drive B has developed a fault. So I've got that unplugged at the moment. I'll need to investigate that later. It's possible it didn't like what it was being asked to do when there was a, a fault with it trying to boot up because part of the information um, that is stored in low RAM is the drive information. So I've got that unplugged. Don't have the keyboard plugged in. I just want to see if we can get any further beyond reading sectors one and two. And uh, we'll see what it does. So I've got the boot disk uh, installed and we'll see uh, what happens. So fingers crossed. Okay, well I'll move the camera and hopefully you can see a bit more clearly uh, what's going on. I'll turn one of the lab lights off, it seems to reduce flickering on this camera. And as you can see we now have a startup menu. It, uh, I didn't see the uh, Osborne logo so I suspect that's just because um, it's not on this uh, particular boot disk. But um, we are now getting some activity. I can't select any of these because I, I don't have the keyboard plugged in. Uh, I still need to replace the uh, last key. I suspect there will be others on the keyboard. I think the keyboard might uh, continue to cause problems for a while. But at least we're now getting a sensible uh, display and it seems to be getting further through the process. And the fact that this information comes from what is copied from the floppy disk and it's properly structured, there are no uh, weird characters or anything. It does tend to indicate that um, we are now getting uh, a proper boot up of the floppy disk and also that the system is uh, to a large uh, degree capable of, uh, of running and booting. Well before finishing this video I had hoped to show you a few uh, brief examples of some of the uh, programs running. The keyboards, um, last time I tried um, to 
buzz out all the keys it seemed to work apart from one they were taking it in turns to fail uh, luckily the ones that I repaired don't seem to fail again but it does take the best part of an hour to do each key and I'm just not prepared to spend a hundred hours on this keyboard um, the machine's not endearing itself to me anyway and uh, this is without doubt the worst keyboard I have ever worked on it's a dreadful design I don't know why anyone would have used a membrane uh, panel for a, uh, a mechanical what should be a mechanical keyboard uh, so I'm not going to waste any more time on this keyboard. I've got a feeling even if I got it working it wouldn't last very long and uh, So this project uh, is kind of on hold now until I can think of a solution for this I very much doubt I can get a replacement keyboard um, So I'll have to try and think of something else uh, I can't even of course fully test the machine at the moment because I can't access the various functions what I might do is just uh, hook up a few uh, more toggle switches so I can at least uh, see if the machine will boot into CPM. Um, it's not actually running CPM proper at the moment, this is just a, a startup menu, uh, but of course I can't really do much with it without a keyboard. If I plug the keyboard in it just uh, won't boot up of course because the uh, some of the keys are apparently um, permanently held down so it just keeps running around in circles so a bit of a shame I think this machine has really been let down the rest of it isn't too bad I'm not a big fan of the daughter board uh, arrangement it makes them difficult to work on but of course when they're working that doesn't really matter the keyboard on a, uh, a machine like this is your kind of primary contact with it and a poor keyboard makes for a, a, a poor experience using these machines um, and in this case uh, it just prevents it being used at all. So um, hopefully I'll be able to pick up on this project again in the future once I've either figured out a, a way to make up a replacement keyboard or located a working replacement. Um, but either way, as I said, I'm not going to waste any more time on this particular keyboard. Um, the keys are just taking it in turn to fail, so I think I'll just be chasing myself running circles uh, indefinitely with this thing. Uh, but at least we have now got the machine uh, to apparently boot to uh, the from the floppy disk uh, which was my primary goal uh, but I would like to get this machine up and running but uh, it's going to have to wait for a while